On my immediate right is Haya Grossberg. She's a community organizer with that with that group, the Mental Health Association of Portland. And on her right is David Green. He's a, he's a volunteer with the same organization. And we're going to talk at length about about the organization. We're also going to talk about some of the the uh, projects that they're working on. Mainly something called Eyes and Ears. It's a it's a local newspaper that they uh, put out, I think, online, and they're wanting to get that out as a hard copy. That's what prompted me to contact them. But then this 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 is a lot larger uh, issue than just than just the eyes and ears, and we'll we'll go into different aspects of that through this conversation. But welcome to the program. No, thank thank you. Yeah. you. And uh, probably first should start with the history of the Mental Health Association. I know that I've known Jason Renault and we've, we've uh, had him on programs in the past and uh, he's really all I know about the Mental Health Association of Portland. So uh, any, any, either one of you want to go into the, the uh, history of it? Okay, well the, the, the Mental Health Association of Portland is a fairly small organization in terms of the number of people involved. There's a board of directors with I think currently eight people on it. It started out a while back, uh, Jason and a few of his friends, uh, uh, neither one of which is, or are still with the organization. You know, to, uh, the death of uh, Jason's childhood friend, uh, James Chassie, at the hands of the Portland police oh, yeah. was, you know, the, what really, you know, got them going and, you know, fired mm -hmm. up and wanting to make a difference with mental health advocacy. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things they did was start a website, uh, mentalhealthportland.org. And the website over the years has become an, an archive of mental health material from uh, the, the Portland metropolitan area and also you know, a bit wider around the state. It's my understanding it's actually the largest archive of mental health material in the United States of America, possibly the world. Mm. You know, wow. They've been loading stuff onto it for many years. Uh, that's one of my duties as a volunteer there. I've uh, searched the local newspapers and stuff for articles and uh, posted onto the website. So it's just anything at all having to do with uh, the mental health? Yeah. Other Pretty much uh, mental health addictions, homelessness, and uh, police misconduct are kind of general areas that all you know fit together pretty mm -hmm. tightly. You know, and then as the organization has uh, evolved, it's uh, been a, a financial sponsor for other organizations like you know Portland Hearing Voices. The Eyes and Ears newsletter. Uh, there was a theater group a few years back that uh, doesn't exist anymore. You know, in general, they just have an eye on helping mental health-related projects in this area, and they've uh, been involved in quite a few over the years. And that would include a, what, a, a documentary, Alien Boy, as well. Yes, that, that's a very important one. Uh, Alien Boy, uh, the life of James Chassie, uh, I think, was the name of it. Uh, Brian Lindstrom uh, w was uh, making the movie. Uh, you, you might know more about where that's at at the, at the moment. But is, that, is that a documentary or something? Yeah, yeah, it's a documentary. I'm not sure exactly where it's at at the moment, but I think it's close to being completed. So that was just one of the projects. And the one we're currently working on is Eyes and Ears, which is this newsletter. Um, oh. Yeah, it's actually, David is one of the editors of it, and it's been around for about five or six years, but it was it had a different name before that. Um, oh, it did. It, it, it actually started in uh, 2001 as the Renaissance Times. The Renaissance Center was a part of Cascadia Behavioral Healthcare. They used to have drop-in centers that were, you know, pretty cool places. You could uh, take classes, uh, just spend time with people. Uh, there were various volunteer things like newsletters and stuff. They were great programs that you know kept people out of the hospital, saved the taxpayers money. So of course they got rid of them after you know mm -hmm. a few years back. You know, wasting all kinds of money, but that's the kind of thing the mental health system does. <laughs> and after the draw, after Renaissance Center closed, the name was was changed because we were told that you know don't put any you know Renaissance is dead. Don't put anything on it. Well, it wasn't too long after that that uh, we became associated with the Mental Health Association of Portland, and now we don't have to worry about that kind of stuff because it's no longer a part of Cascadia, although they've 
they still do things like you know print copies for clients and stuff. But did you, you know. did you solicit um, articles from people, or is this pretty much an in-house newsletter? Well, people are welcome to submit articles, especially um, especially people who have a mental health diagnosis or have had mental health struggles are really encouraged to submit articles. And most of the articles are by people involved with the Mental Health Association of Portland. Like, um, there's an interview with Christy Jameson, who is the director of Empowerment Initiatives, but she's also very involved with volunteering and supporting the Mental Health Association of Portland. And then there's Will Hall has an article in this one, and he does Portland Hearing Voices. So that's another project under um, the Mental Health Association of Portland, but the article in here is about another one of his projects called Open Dialogue. So the articles involve either perspectives or alternative treatments in a lot of cases, or things in the news that are that are upcoming involving mental health issues. But th these are like the kind of articles that you won't find in another mainstream newspaper. Um, they're very different, cutting edge kind of thing. Um, and then there's all these resources, and a lot of the resources are also very alternative. They're the kinds of things that the average person might not really know about. Um, like for even the Portland Hearing Voices group is an example of that, which is you know under the umbrella of the Mental Health Association of Portland, and that's a group for people who identify as <clears throat> either hearing voices or having visions or extreme states of consciousness, and it's actually a worldwide movement. Um, the Hearing Voices movement started in the UK, but <clears throat> there's a chapter in Portland that was founded by Will Hall, and um, you might want to say more about that, about the Hearing that Voices. That sounds interesting, though. Is, yeah. it, it is actually a, a formally a, a chapter of an of a international movement, or is just you yeah. just using that name? It is. It's it formally is. a chapter. Yeah, the, the international group is called InterVoice. Inter, I-N-T-E-R? Yeah. Intervoice, and I, I think that's their website as well. Mm -hmm. There's a national organization, the, you know, the International Intervoice, and we actually had some speakers uh, from that. A, while, a gentleman named Ron Coleman from Scotland, a very inspirational fellow, who has spoken empowerment initiatives. Mm -hmm. so that that was like the international end of it, and then there's a national organization, and then locally organizations all over, including Will Hull's group. You know, and Will Hull is actually a you know fairly well-known activist, uh, even outside of Hearing Voices. He's also on the board of directors of something called the Foundation for Excellence in Mental Health Care, which is a national organization. Mm -hmm. You know, his name is familiar to me. Did he have anything to do with that rethinking psychiatry? <clears throat> um, uh, I'm not sure if he's. He has. He presents things for their group, um, they, and they have a film festival, which he he has a film of his work at. Um, but I just want to go back to the Hearing Voices group for one second just to say that um, the really I've actually been to the groups and I just did a facilitator training for to do facilitation of the Hearing Voices groups and the really cool thing about the Hearing Voices group is that there are people that come for all different reasons. So people who hear voices, who identify as hearing voices or having extreme states of consciousness have so many different varied experiences. And I think that's what's really incredible about that group. Because um, I think one of the issues with mental health is that people make assumptions. You know, that if someone has a diagnosis of, let's say, schizophrenia or bipolar or schizoaffective, whatever it is, there's all kinds of assumptions that go with that. Or even if you hear the term um, that somebody has heard voices, it's just fascinating how many different things that can mean to different people, which is basically why the um, hearing voices movement started. It's usually a negative connotation to most yeah, people. Yeah, it is, yeah. but you know what's yeah. amazing is that in the group tons of people actually say that they have positive experiences. I mean there's really both. Both there's people that feel that it's negative, people that feel it's positive, and people who feel mixed about it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really interesting to go a little bit deeper and like actually in the group, you know, listen to what people say. It's pretty fascinating. I, I know that if I were to say, Jim, I'm hearing voices all the time, he, he would say, well, you know, he'd probably have a a funny thought about that, mm -hmm. but if you're going to someone that's going to help you, then I can understand it. Is that what you're saying? Well, it's well, the cool thing about the group is that it's a whole group of people who've had that ex some ex yeah. version of that experience, help which is so different for everyone, you know. Okay. But yeah, so it's like coming together with other people who've had some version of that experience, and um, you know, 
just comparing like well what's similar and what's different and it's mm-hmm. amazing though what I've noticed is how different everyone's experience of oh. that is actually well you know <clears throat> it's easy to come up with a negative uh, people hear voices like what well, was it Berkowitz the, the, the ser- serial killer that uh, had a neighbor's dog telling him to kill people that's, the, that's what people think about in my mind when they when they say hearing voices but that is just the st- extreme negative side of it there is uh, uh, another side of it and what, what are some of the, the more benign or positive aspects of people hearing voices well you know I was at a group recently where someone was talking about seeing UFOs and hearing things <clears throat> from UFOs and he seemed to not find it to be negative at all he felt like it was somewhat entertaining and interesting and it was giving him ideas for his artwork or just giving not I mean he wasn't necessarily making artwork with it but it sounded like everybody in the group was like that sounds like something you could make and write a novel about or make some artwork about Mm-hmm. Um, and other people seem to feel like they get guidance from their voices. Um, like it's more of like an intuitive voice hearing sort of thing. Um, Do they make it up? Do they make up what they're talking about? or? Do you believe they all have experienced hearing certain things? Oh yeah, no, at the group, yeah, everyone. Well, no, individually, talks. could Do someone you? come in there and say, "Well, I hear voices, and they tell me to walk down the street," or I mean, or could they be oh. making it up? Some what do you mean? By that? Making up the what the voices say. Well, why so, would they do that? Okay, that's the answer to the question. <laughs> well, you know, they could be doing it for I'm attention okay or with something. That. There's a lot of ways, <laughs> reasons people come up with things. You know, just just to stand out and be different. There's, you know, there's a lot of things that could be going on, but but the uh, the hearing voices. This organization now it is a complete separate organization. From Mental Health from, Association. From Mental Health Association. Yeah, it's a, it's a separate group, but it's Will Hall who runs it is one of the board members. So basically all the board members have their own projects with the Mental Health Association mm-hmm. of Portland. So that's his project, which is sponsored by the Mental Health Association mm-hmm. of Portland. All right. And it, it doesn't have a separate website. It does have a separate it website. It does, yeah. And that was the... Uh, the hearingvoices.org or something like that. Yeah, and it has a whole separate collective of facilitators, just like Eyes and Ears has its own collective of people who edit it and work on it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the different projects. And the great thing about this Eyes and Ears is that like the Portland Hearing Voices, it has a whole realm of resources that are available for people that are kind of like Portland Hearing Voices, just the kind of thing that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find um, like as a possibility for mental health recovery or just as an option or because mm-hmm. there's so, like in the mainstream it, it seems like there are very few ways of looking at things or very few options for mental health recovery mm-hmm. but what I value about this newsletter is that it gives a lot of different options a lot of different you know it, it gives all the options so it doesn't really take any sides as to which ones are better or worse it just gives all the different choices the choices yeah. <clears throat> now this is uh this is a hard copy in front of us but this is available on the website yeah it's free to mm. anyone on the website mm. and we're trying to raise funds right now to um distribute more paper copies to people who don't have internet access Right. People take for granted that everybody has internet access, and <laughs> since you can go to the library and get on the internet, it is available to a lot of people. But there are people that can't. Yeah. There, and there are actually, even somebody on our board, there are people who have trouble being in front of a computer for a long time. Which because of the monitor, the monitor, the lighting of the monitor or something? Yeah. There's somebody actually on our board who has trouble sitting in front of a computer, and there are a lot of other people that do too, especially if you're reading like a 22-page newsletter. Um, oh yeah. So yeah. not only the computer issue, but also if if they only have access at the library, they might not have time to read it there. They might have a lot of other more important, you know, more pressing practical matters they have to do when they're at the library. Um, and then yeah, there are a lot of people also who kind of shut in a little bit or living in a residential facility and might just have very limited internet access. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So what you're wanting to do is is a uh, is a uh, get some funds in order to to. Uh, uh, provide hard copies for people, and if, if, if folks want to want to find out more about this organization and and and, and the, some of the things, ways that you can support them, you can go to the uh, what was it, Mental Health Association of Portland? I forget the exact Mental Health Portland. Mental Health org. Portland. That, mm-hmm. that graphic has been up a few times. There it is again. Yeah. So mentalhealthportland.org. Mm-hmm. org. So, and the the actual fundraising campaign is being done as, as through Kickstarter. 
Uh-huh. You know, so if you, if you go to, I think it's kickstarter.com, and you know they have the little box at, at the top you can type in, just type in eyes and ears, and it'll take you directly to mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the actual fundraising thing where you yeah. can you know, right. click on the various choices and so hopefully donate. What is, kick, what is Kickstarter? Kickstarter, well, I, I'll answer that in one second. I just want to also say Go ahead, I don't want to break your train of thought there. <laughs> you can also visit our Facebook page if you want to see updates on the campaign and or just, or just general news articles are on our Facebook page, which is okay. Mental Health Association of Portland. But the Kickstarter, um, <clears throat> Kickstarter is a campaign. It's a way of raising funds for, for any kind of project. Um, and the, our goal is 4000 So you, on Kickstarter, you have a goal for how much money you want to raise. And then if you don't raise that much, you don't get any of it. So you have to raise the amount of your goal in your set oh, amount of time. Really? So our set amount of time was 30 days. So I think it's approximately for the month of February because we started last week. So we have three weeks left and we've raised a little over 1000 So we still have to raise 3000 more. Otherwise, we won't get any of it. Mm -hmm. oh. So that's the way Kickstarter works. So I, I, the Kickstarter isn't isn't something having to do with mental health association. Support. No, not at all. It's just it's Matching just a way funds. that different um, organizations or projects can raise money for anything. Nice. Yeah. I had never heard of that. So it isn't it isn't specific to this this particular eyes and ears project. Then it's other pro they have right. other projects as well. Yeah, yeah. Like anybody, if you want to donate money, you can go on there and just look for a project that you believe in and find one that you like and support it oh there's no problem finding <laughs> <laughs> i think the, or the forest advocacy group bark that i'm with actually i think they were involved with that a while back maybe a year or two ago because the name did strike a bell so well all right that that's great that's something i hadn't even heard of we talked a little bit uh, quite a, at length about about mental health and uh here in portland and uh, why is it necessary for, for like Jason to start this? Isn't isn't there enough city or state or county uh, help for mentally health? Mentally, I don't know what to, what to, mentally disturbed, yeah. mental, is, however is you want to phrase that. Is there a government? <laughs> okay. Do you work with the government in any form? No. No? It, it's an important aspect of the Mental Health Association of Portland that they're absolutely independent oh, okay. of government funding and all the mess that goes right. with it. It's quite often the government <laughs> mental health care system it ends up being part of the problem on some level. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because of the because of the the, the things that they demand, the hoops you got to jump through, say, or mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. You know, if you're a person with a problem and you need help, you know, coming in, you know, off the street, you know, you know, I'm hearing voices or I'm manic or whatever, it can be an awful mess trying to get any help. You know, it, it takes a long time to get yourself certified as disabled. I mean, it can take you know, a, a year or more sometimes, at which point you're going in and out of the emergency room in the meantime. Yeah. You know, the, a, a lot of the health care agencies, uh, well, they've, they're not properly funded. You know, they have all kinds of bizarre bureaucracies they have to follow. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, the the yeah. red tape will just kill you. You know, the, the the turnover rate among employees is fairly high, you know, so, I mean, if you're someone w with a serious problem like mental illness, yeah. it's really important that you can work with someone you can build a trusting relationship with. And that's almost impossible to do when you have these people, you know, coming <laughs> and going and maybe they're only working there a year oh. or... You know, yeah, that, that's been a Within huge these problem. Agencies, you mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and another issue is that a lot of the government funding comes from pharmaceutical companies. A lot of the funding that's going towards mental health services. So, and, and even the education of the people in the mental health system, which, like the government-funded mental health system, is being sponsored by pharmaceutical companies a lot of the time. So there's a lot of lack of options, lack of informed consent. Um, lack of education being given to people, or just like a one-sided approach. It's like the, the government only funds certain services. You know, they, they fund a very limited number of types of services. And like David was saying, it's somewhat impersonal. It has an impersonal kind of feeling, especially for people who can't afford, you know, higher quality care. You know, if for people who don't have health insurance or can't afford um, you know, therapy or any other type of mental health treatment that they would want are kind of stuck with whoever they get, like whatever person they're assigned. 
Um, that person has a bunch of other people that, that underneath them as well. Yeah, the, right. the, the case loads just get bigger and right. bigger and That's bigger. Word, yeah. yeah. Right. It, it it seems to me that the the uh, the situation with this is is uh, it's not getting any better. I would think oh, it's, it's worse. Getting worse. All I've the time. been a, a client of the local system here since 1987, and I got better services 20 years ago. Hmm. They are way way worse now. They used to have you know like like I said the drop-in centers that offered you know just the the warmth of human contact, I mean, it's the simplest way to put it, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's something, a place you could, you know, feel safe and, you know, start to rebuild your life from, and they got rid of all that. You know, the, the, the caseloads, like I said, have gone up, so you have less individual time with, you know, the people you're working with. Mm -hmm. You know, like Haya said, uh, what they fund is very limited, you know, so it's it's really easy to, you know, to get the medications that are going to slowly kill you over the years. <laughs> and it's really difficult to get, you know, peer support yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, other things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think peer support is another really good thing to touch on because what I feel like is happening is that as the top-down model gets worse and worse, there's more and more peer support happening now, I think. And it's not necessarily, I mean, some of it's being funded by the government, but a lot of it is just happening naturally. And that's part of what the Mental Health Association of Portland supports is, I mean, like the, the Hearing Voices group, that's a peer support model. Mm -hmm. And even just working together, like volunteers in the Mental Health Association of Portland working on advocacy together or just connecting on different projects is actually a really important element of helping one another, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you touched on it just briefly. It seems to me that the the, uh, the typical Western medicine way of, of handling things is just to mask it with drugs. Exactly. I would imagine that is even probably even more so in, 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 in this area. Yeah. Absolutely, because like you, you take the you know, hearing voices itself, you know, you're hearing a voice. What are the different ways to handle that? Suppress it with a drug. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, 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 the traditional system is, you know, fill them full of drugs so basically they're you know too loopy to you know <laughs> that's to right. hear the voice you know. that. <laughs> mm -hmm. or yeah. just that they won't or they'll be too sedated to really cause any problems by the extreme state yeah. mm -hmm. and, and the alternative methods you know like uh, it, i think came up earlier the open dialogue method that that's actually a method that started in finland and the idea is that the very first time you have any kind of a problem they you know, bring in a team of people. They they involve all your relatives, you know, your friends. You know, it's just you know, real you know, kind of village. You know, takes a village kind of approach. Mm -hmm. And when people get that kind of help right at the beginning, mm -hmm. sometimes they never have another episode again for the rest of their life. Oh. You know, mm -hmm. so it's low cost. Mm -hmm. People are never on any drugs whatsoever, and it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. It's a real thing that's documented and you know studied, and you know it exists. And yet they don't do that at all in this country. You know they've stuff you full of pills that, and and the effects of those pills. I mean, that's something we really should touch on here because those things will kill you. You end up with diabetes, you know, mm -hmm. kidney problems, uh, extreme overweight, uh, just. And they prolong the affliction, if you want to think of it as affliction. Your affliction they never pro ends. They prolong it rather right. than deal yeah. with it. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I can imagine how deal, just having other people around that, that can try to help you can make all the difference for some of these yeah. people. Just having yeah. uh, regular people, your yeah. peers that you can talk to. Because these yeah. guys, a mental health thing is, they, they're really so isolated in a lot of cases. It's I would true. think. It's true. And, you know, sometimes the system can further the isolation. <coughs> I think that's maybe what you're getting at. Uh, right. Because, right. Um, well, there's one model called Soteria, um, which was a project done. I um, can't remember where it was done, but basically they just brought people who were experiencing a first episode of psychosis or whatever you want to call that type of meltdown um, were just brought into a house with normal people, not therapists, not psychologists, not psychiatrists, no doctors or anything, just with like regular people who were living with them. And basically they all recovered. There was no medication except for just sleeping pills for people who like hadn't slept in weeks or whatever and just needed to sleep. But um, 
But yeah, it was basically pretty much 100% everyone recovered um, just from being given a basic like community structure without any oh. really mm -hmm. no, there was no special training of, of any of the people there. It was all just ordinary people um, who were just there relating with them and living with them. Well, right. that sort of thing tends to diffuse the problem before it really yeah. starts. But whereas if you throw drugs at it and then you, you treat it the typical way, then you augment it. You, you, you polarize it, crystallize it, it seems like. Where what you're talking right. about with, mm -hmm. with, with peers and with people that care, it kind of diffuses it. This goes along a lot with what I, about a year ago or more, I taped a fellow that came to town is the, for the Rethinking Psychiatry. Yep. Uh -huh. I forget the fellow's name. Oh, was it Bob Whitaker? Whitaker, yeah. oh, and unfortunately really? I had a camera mill function and I lost <laughs> everything and I wasn't able to do anything with it. But uh, it was an incredible talk and exactly what we're talking about. He gave a, a lot of examples of, of what we're saying here about, about uh, long-term uh, experiments and, and uh, studies of drugs where it did exactly what you're saying. The drugs in the long run made things worse whereas other alternatives, especially if they were taken care of early, diffused the whole situation. Yeah. But that doesn't seem to be the way the medical Western civilization or Western medicine wants to do this. And how is it? How does your organization encourage alternatives to that? Well, through you know sponsoring Portland Hearing Voices, working you know collaboratively with you know groups. You know, like uh, Empowerment Initiatives has mm -hmm. been mentioned, uh, they're actually a mental health agency, you know, with a, a, a contract of, with Clackamas County at this point, but they have the distinction, everyone who works there is also a person with a mental illness, you know, so any client of Empowerment Initiatives, everyone they're dealing with is someone just like them who's had the same experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, so that, that, that's a very radical concept, you know, and uh, there aren't too many agencies like that around. You know, the last one, uh, there's a place called Mind Empowered about 20 years ago, and huh. from that to here, you know, the you know, Mind Empowered and Empowerment Initiatives is about all there's been along that line in the mm -hmm. local area. You know, just that whole concept of peers helping each other. You know, th there is limited funding. You know, it's like I said, Empowerment Initiative does have a, a contract with you know Clackamas County Mental Health. You know, but still, that's you know most of the money is you know the drugs and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the cheapest way to go. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's funny because it's it's the cheapest way to go only because of our system. In short term, I speak. I mean, only yeah. because of the way the system works. But really, it's actually very expensive. I mean, if you think about how much the drugs cost, it's extremely expensive, but, you know, like actually to fund alternatives would be a lot cheaper in most cases mm -hmm. in the long term. Long term, right. Um, but another thing that I wanted to say to answer your question about how the Mental Health Association supports alternatives is that one of them is actually with this Eyes and Ears newsletter because it provides a list of all the different alternatives available in the Oregon area. So by publishing this every month, we're, and by trying to increase the number of print copies also, that's another way that we're supporting. And also this, there are articles in here that talk about different alternatives. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is also just about information and informing people of all the different choices that they might have. Because I think one of the main obstacles in recovery from mental health issues is lack of awareness of all the different ways of looking at something and all the different options. Because even our mental health system is really just one way of looking at reality. You know, it's not even, it's not even objective. It's just our, it's just our society's way of looking at what people are going through. You know, every, every culture, every time period has their own way of defining what it means to be mentally ill mm -hmm. and how to treat it. Well, like Native Americans, they honored people that seemed a little bit different, <laughs> oh, you know? Right. And, and, and they, had, they had their own terminology for them and, and for the uh, 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 Indians that uh, say cross-dressed or were, were gay, they honored them and they had a special place for them. They didn't. Yeah. They didn't make them feel isolated, oh, which exaggerates their condition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you were to consider that a condition, right. in this respect, we're talking about it as a condition, but actually, it's not. It's a 
different way of being, like you're saying, a separate right. reality. And there are all kinds of like really out there, outrageous ways of being that are acceptable in our society, mm -hmm. and that aren't labeled as a mental illness, but really are just as crazy as things that are, you know, in my opinion. <laughs> Yeah, I, can name, I can name a couple right off the bat, like extreme um, religiosity, possibly. Right. Would be a way, to, you know, yeah. fundamentalist uh -huh. type thing. Yeah. Would, would pop into my mind to go along with what you're saying. Of course, someone who was there wouldn't think so. But, you know, we, we've... Uh, did you have a question yeah. there? Uh, you said you, this started with uh, James Chassie? Chassie. Chassie, right. I mean, I'm, I've seen it written so many times. So, th then... What about the aspect that some people subconsciously really want to commit suicide in that way, like that? Forgetting Chasey, Chasey, going on to some other situations where I think people still, the, their mental condition leads them into unknowingly finding a way to be killed by the police or someone someone like that because they don't have the nerve to do it themselves maybe because huh. mm -hmm. that's kind of difficult I still don't know how anybody com commit suicide anyway but if they ha are going to have someone else do it then of course it turns out to be the police Wh what about mentally like that does that well wh what people can... really want is help not yeah. death there's when somebody is in a state like that you know the I mean, just imagine you have no hope, you know, you, yeah, you don't think yes. there's any reason to go on, you know, what, what the hell is the point of, you know, being alive. No light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, no, exactly. Right. Okay. When you are in that state of mind, mm -hmm. you do not want death, you want help. Okay. You want the pain to stop. Mm -hmm. You want something to happen. You know, so it's it's very simplistic to say, you know, that you know, that grotesque term suicide by cop. Yes, you know. it is. It's difficult, but it's you know, it's there. Yeah, the the term is out there, but it's just horribly misleading because yeah, what yeah. people want is help, not That's death. Right. That's right. Know, mm -hmm. And they are not getting the help. You know, and for the police to play into that and to use as the excuse, you know, oh, we didn't have any choice but to shoot the guy or you know, I, mm -hmm. I just posted an article on the website today where you know, one of the, the police trainers was saying that they actually train police officers to believe that suicidal people are also homicidal. And that's just completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Think of all the cases you've heard of, of police officers shooting a suicidal guy. And now name me one case where suicidal guy shot a police officer. That guy up there in Rainier, unfortunately. But he wasn't suicidal. He was committing a crime at the time, too. Exactly. Right? It was, that mm -hmm. was a difficult situation. There are mentally ill people who have committed crimes and killed police officers, but they are not the ones who are suicidal and call 911. Yeah. See, that's a completely mm -hmm. different thing. Right. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's where actually where I was going to go next, and I was going to use James Chassie because he's a really good example of a, of a, a person that was supposedly uh, mentally disturbed and was urinating in the street, although they never proved that that even that condition even happened. And and uh, Jason, I think, came on a program not too long after that, and I know that Dan Handelman with Peace and Justice Works, and Cop Watch, has also worked with trying to get training for these officers. And as you're saying, the training seems to be going the opposite direction if they're training them to, to believe that these, these folks uh, pose a threat to society as well as to themselves. Yeah. Right, and what, men, what we would like to see at the Mental Health Association of Portland is that the cops not be involved at all in suicidal issues. Like, what we would like is for there to be some intersection, you know, interception when somebody with suicidal calls 911 you know, or, or somebody or, close by. You know, first of all, we'd prefer if they didn't call 911 in the first place. It, it would be better if Good they idea. called the crisis yeah. hotline. You know, so we're trying to get the word out more about the crisis hotline. That's so an that, important outreach. Yeah. yeah, and you can see that on our website, too. The crisis hotline is right there. It's the yeah. first thing you'll see when you go to the website, basically. And th and there's actually a billboard campaign, you know, that started after the Scanner newspaper did an editorial saying, you know, don't call 911. 
Oh. You know, they, they ended up with you know, a billboard campaign, you know, d diverting people to the crisis line, basically. You know, and the Mental Health Association of Portland was involved in that project. Is the crisis hotline is that a government agency, no. Metro, or or eight hundred number? Yeah, it's an eight hundred number, but isn't yeah. it peer run? I'm pretty sure. I don't remember at this yeah, point. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's not. Um, I mean, the main thing that it's is that it's not the cops. The problem is yeah. that. So many people, the only number they have in their mind is 911. You yeah. know, when it's oh, a crisis, yeah. it's yeah. the only number they have. Mm -hmm. But but cops, you know, have really should have nothing to do with a mental health crisis because po cops should be there for an actually, you know, dangerous situation. But, I mean, sure, suicidality can be considered dangerous, but it's very, very virtually never happens that suicidal people are dangerous to others. Um, and cops just have no training in how to actually calm somebody down. I mean, people are scared of cops, you know. Mm -hmm. If I was in a mental health crisis, a cop would just make it, like, all over the top really worse, you know. It. Anybody who was having any sort of crisis would not feel comforted by a cop, you know, if it was, unless it was like that somebody was actually attacking them and they needed protection, but besides that, it's not well, not appropriate. And some of these things, the, the these guys end up with guns or things that look like guns and who one of the last ones is Aaron right. Campbell right. Or, uh, I committed a robbery I got a gun right. I'm gonna do something the, 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 that was the not Aaron Campbell. To do? no Aaron Campbell goes back a couple years. he was the one who shot in the back I think yeah the it, well what this is the one that was you're thinking the going smart on. park garage of just what's just the last name week of the or person something. Uh, Brad Morgan was the one who had the replica handgun. Is that the one you're thinking of? It was in the. Uh, well, no, this was in the paper. I'm just, well, just recently, and it was yeah. it was in the uh, parking garage, like you're talking about. Yeah, that that, and, that, that was Brad Morgan. And yeah. I forgot about uh, uh, exactly what came on with it. There, first they said he was suicidal, and they said he had a weapon. And as it turned out, I don't think that a lot of the the preliminary uh, reports that came out were even true. I can't remember what all came came about with that, but so, uh, somebody was just recently. This may be mixing up a couple of them here, but just recently, a woman called 911, and it's not the first time somebody has called uh, the police for uh, a drunk or somebody having a, a a mental episode, and the cops end up shooting them. Oh yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. that specific one uh, was in Fairview. A gentleman named Leo McKinnon. Basically, oh. he, he had a knife, but he, he wasn't really threatening anyone in particular with it. Mm -hmm. you know, he, his mother did not feel threatened. The, the police were not close enough to be in any kind of danger. And, you know, once again, they shot him. You know, they didn't have to. Mm -hmm. you know, just because there's a big scary knife doesn't mean you're, you know, the police officer is going to get skewered. You know, I mean, they had some distance, but... Uh, Nope. They took the option they take all too often and just killed the guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In front of his uh, his mother, I think it was, or yeah. something to that. First time I heard of this, it happened out in Beaverton. I think the young man was drunk. And, you know, if you're drunk... Lucas Glenn. Hmm? Lucas Glenn. Yeah, right. <laughs> and if you're, uh, if you're uh, you know, inebriated or you're going through a, an emotional episode, you don't have to be mentally disturbed, just going through an emotional episode of some kind, maybe heightened by alcohol. Yeah. You, know, you can lose track of, of your behavior and uh, that doesn't deserve to be executed. And that's basically, that's yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. They're executing the guy just because it's the easiest way to solve the problem. Yeah. And, you know, drugs and execution are not how a a sensitive and, and a caring society deals with people I think and exactly. that's exactly what your organization is trying to intercede in there somewhere in such a way as to as to sh is to show these folks that uh, in a they're in some cases they're not crazy and uh, you know there are people to care about them and they can't get that information to the police that very fast is that right you just can't get here's this situation they're, they're yeah. all over the place and the police can't get this information where they say well he's harmless or she's right. harmless or whatever they do right yeah because it's like cops don't really have that training and the structure isn't set up for cops to really to, to get that information to, fast. to get, yeah to yeah. either get the information or to even know how to deal right, with it right, because right. you know mm -hmm. cops are trained to deal with emergence like to deal with violent situations right. for the most part and most of these aren't violent situations. Uh -huh. And then they just get escalated into them, but 
they shouldn't be. You know, our our vision is to have more of a crisis team that has nothing to do with the cops at all involved when somebody's feeling suicidal mm-hmm. or in well, a crisis. So optimally, you say the crisis team should be the ones who are called. <clears throat> but until that wonderful day when we yeah, get yeah. we get the folks. Mm-hmm. You know, out there who are viewing and, and, and folks who, who uh, live in Portland to call the other number rather than the 911. Is there any way that we can try to get the police to undergo some kind of sensitivity training or whatever the terminology? I know Dan Allen with, with Copwatch has talked about this, and has, there's been no headway made that I know of. Mm. Do, is there any training within the police department to, to uh, have some folks out there that, that have some kind of understanding of these, of these issues? They have training, but it is woefully inadequate. <laughs> and it's probably volunteer, too. Right. <coughs> yeah, I mean, one of the things we're trying to do is just get the word out as much as possible so that it, just through the media, you know, writing editorials, spreading the word about the events that do occur so that it's more you know, in the mainstream eye so that cops know, just like Cop Watch, that cops know they're being watched and that that they should be more careful, you know, before they shoot someone. It's it's not, um, you know, because there is a way in which cops feel like they have a lot of leeway and feel like yeah. as cops mm-hmm. they're almost entitled to shoot at the slightest feeling of anxiety, but... Well, like I say, we, we can also go back to this painter Sheriff Painter, Rainier, he, if he may probably, if he, he wait, maybe waited too long, and that's when he got shot. Mm-hmm. See, it, it, it's very difficult. We These never really know. Difficult. Well, with Painter also, remember, he was shot with his own gun, and mm-hmm. the actual mentally ill person had no weapon of any kind. Jeez. I don't know how that yeah, happened. He certainly didn't didn't pay much attention to what was going on. Yeah, there. yeah. He, <laughs> so in our remaining time, we should need to kind of uh, go back over everything here. But uh, Oregon State Hospital tours. You, you wrote that down for me a while back, and and and, and, and what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to be running some tours of the Oregon State Hospital um, in the spring. So mm-hmm. I just wanted to mention that for anybody who's interested, because the Oregon State Hospital has been going on, undergoing a lot of transformation in the past year or so um, and we're going to be giving tours to basically anybody <clears throat> who's interested in seeing the new developments. Um, I'm sure you know more than I do about the history of the Oregon State Hospital if you want to chime in. Well basically the, the Oregon State Hospital got international acclaim a while back as a site for One Flew Over the I was the just thinking nest. that, right. Exactly. Yeah. Nurse Ratchet and all that. Where, where is that? In, in Salem. It's in Salem. Oh, it is still in Salem. Yeah, okay. so we're going to okay. be having some buses go, um, tour, bring people out for a whole day oh. to tour the hospital and see the different things going on there now. Is that specifically yeah. for, for a psychiatric hospital? Yeah. Yes. It, it, in the past, we used to have hospitals that were more available for just you know anyone who needed to be in a hospital. But at this point in time, the Oregon State Hospital is mostly for forensic patients. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's you know people who are you know guilty except for insanity, basically. Oh, I see. You know, and because of the horrific you know conditions at the hospital in the past, they've you know. Com- you know, tore down most of it. You know, it's pretty much rebuilt from the ground up. You know, and uh, well, it's one of those things where they they tell you everything is you know wonderful and perfect and so much better. The the reality <laughs> is somewhere in the middle. It is right. a lot better than it used to be, but it right. isn't as good as they're saying it is. Well, they're taking up the slack that uh, damage. Yeah, it's it, yeah. it's been some time since since uh, we lost damage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which itself was a rather a hellhole, kind of so, a bedlam. Oh. Yeah, so it's you know no love lost there. But the important thing to recognize about the hospitals is that that's like the worst way you can help people. Putting people, I mean, you know, you could say, well, you're putting people in there with their peers, but, <laughs> but uh, that's not what you meant, right? Yeah, that that is not good peer support. Right. You know? <laughs> you know, getting people out into the community in smaller facilities is a much better way to go, much cheaper. All the evidence shows that. 
fact, there, there was another article I came across recently where in Vermont they had to, in fairly short order, get rid of their state hospital because there was you know horrible flood damage and stuff. Oh. You know, so the whole article is describing you know the, all the money they're saving because it's so much cheaper to put people in the community. Mm -hmm. oh. And yet here in Oregon, they're still talking about building a new hospital down in Junction City. You know, despite the fact that you know everyone with a brain is against it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I wanted to ask you about this, the man up there to do with the painter, Sheriff Painter. You've seen him on television. Have you seen some of the video of him in the courtroom? A, a little. Because yeah. I was going to ask you what your opinion is to whether or not he, his mental state, if you had an opinion on that. Oh, I. The, the judge thinks he's faking it. Faking? Faking. One yeah. of the problems with that thing is, you know, people should not diagnose other people from a distance. I mean, that's just, yeah. if you want to call something crazy, that's crazy. <laughs> you know? It's crazy that the judge would make that determination. <laughs> exactly. You know, he, he, he's not a mental health professional. He, you know, is, doesn't have that experience. You know, it's just crazy for him to make a statement like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Understandable. Well, down to about a little yeah, less than three yeah. minutes, so we'll kind of go full circle. I think we covered a lot of the different issues. We could go on and on just just with this aspect about the uh, the, the the Portland police not having the ability, and apparently it seems like even the desire to to uh, do something about their their interaction with the people and in, in, in they're having some kind of mental uh, episode. But there are so many things that your organization, the Mental Health Association of Portland, is doing. And the main reason I called to begin with was trying to get hard copies of this Eyes and Ears. So we'll kind of finish off with that. Eyes and Ears is a, is a, is a, a it's more of a newsletter than a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, what you're trying to do is, is get it, get this more hard copies out to the, to the people. Where would you distribute this if you got them, just briefly? We'd like to distribute them at a lot of the different mental health agencies, at places that people go for resources, Ooh. and to individuals, you know, if people want a personal subscription, it's actually really cheap to just, you can get it, if you donated, I think it's $10 on our Kickstarter campaign, you can get um, a personal subscription to it, so mm -hmm. it can be mailed to you mm -hmm. every month, and mm -hmm. I don't know if you had other ideas. Um, well, you yeah, the... The newsletter right now is, is distributed uh, at the clinics of a place called Cascadia, uh, Cascadia Behavioral Health Care, but uh, oh. the, the important thing about this is that you need to make it available where the people are. You know, so m much as we dislike the traditional clinics, if you want to reach a large number yeah. of people with mental illness, you know, going where they are, you know, the, the clinics is the place you can reach the most of them. You know, so... That makes sense, sure. Yeah, you know, so just, just having a pile of these in the clinics that, you know, somebody who comes in, you know, in a crisis or just for their regular appointment, they see this on the counter and they, you know, pick it up, get reading and, you know, learn a thing or two and, you know, have a little hope in their life. Yeah. yeah. Well, I see we're down to about 40 seconds. I appreciate you both coming in. <laughs> Thank oh, you. It went quick. Yeah. So That's right. uh, we want to thank our crew, without which we could not do this. So we yeah. really appreciate uh, our crew taking care and being there in the control room and on camera and everywhere else here. All right. We really always, appreciate it. Thanks. You, you see us out here, but there's you know twice that many folks that are manning the cameras and, yep. and in the control room. And uh, I want to thank the guests. You did, Dave and uh, Haya. You did a great job. And uh, it's a very important organization that you're that you're working with, volunteering yeah, and working with. Yeah, just so. doing that. All right, somewhere for somebody. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next month. <laughs> <laughs>